Well, um, thank you everyone for, um, for joining us. Um, this is a town hall um, that is um, put together by uh, the Durham Committee, the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People with Omar Beasley, who is our chair, and Dr. Wanda Boone, who is the chair of uh, our Health and Safety Committee. So thank you both um, for, uh, for putting this together for us. There are a lot of um, questions and information and misinformation that's uh, out there about COVID-19 and the resources available and how it's affecting our community. And so we wanted to put something together um, to um, share with, uh, with the community about what is actually going on and uh, what we can do um, as a people to protect ourselves. Um, from COVID-19. So I will turn it over to Dr. Wanda Boone and she will introduce, introduce our panelists. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, this new technology that we're all dealing with, um, even though we have some glitches, we're gonna get it done, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, um, I just wanted to uh, continue to go along here and let you know how we'll proceed in this next hour or so. Um, so you've had an introduction from uh, Angie, and then we're going to hear from Attorney Jasmine McGee. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the data. I hope this is in order. <laughs> um, from Dr. Elaine Hart Brothers, the impact on seniors and vulnerable populations. Dr. Ruby Long, a view from the ER or what she would like to present uh, about that. Dr. Jonathan Livingston, um, talking about trauma. If he's not able to join us, then I'll touch on that subject. Uh, Dr. Robert Patterson, a personal story of his recovery from COVID-19. Uh, uh, Mr. Rodney Jenkins, who's the director of the Durham County Department of Public Health, and we'd like to hear about testing and what kinds of things the health department is doing to keep us safe and protected. And then we'll talk about going forward. So Jasmine, what would you like to say to us this evening? From the office of attorney, uh, look what I wrote, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Boone. Um, as Dr. Boone said, my name is Jasmine McGee. I'm the Special Deputy Attorney General and Director of Public Protection for North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein. Um, I may be the only non-doctor or public health professional on the call, so I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to participate and uh, share information with you. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of information and even some links in the short amount of time that I have. Um, so let me preface my remarks by telling you that much of what I'm going to say is on uh, the coronavirus page for our, um, for our office, which can be found at ncdoj.gov slash COVID-19. Um, and I'll make sure we can send that out afterwards as well. So a lot of this information is there. So don't um, feel like you have to get it all the first time through. Um, so obviously, because we're here as a part of the Durham Committee's uh, health committee, uh, that in a crisis like this, our first focus ought to be on keeping people healthy, um, which is why our office is doing everything we can to support the governor's public health response uh, to the pandemic. Uh, at the same time, hundreds of North Carolinians have lost their jobs and many have lost the health care uh, that was linked to their jobs. And so we also have to do everything we can to help pe keep people's money safe in this context. Um, and we want to help make sure that people um, have um, less to worry about in terms of their money um, while they're also thinking about their health and the, and the state's response here. Um, and I want to, in that context, highlight a few things that our office is working on. Um, first of all, one of the roles that our office has is to collect debt um, that is owed to the state of North Carolina. And the state of North Carolina is actually a fairly, fairly large debt collector um, in the state. Uh, a lot of people owe money to the state um, and we're not collecting on that as the state's lawyers right now because people need um, a lot, every little bit of money that they have right now. Um, and Attorney General Stein has also asked uh, and urged that the Department of Education and the Department of Veterans Affairs um, help student loan borrowers and veterans in the same way. 
Um, we have also worked with the governor's office um, on an executive order you may have seen on utilities. Um, that, that executive order prohibited utilities from disconnecting North Carolinians' water, gas, and power during the pandemic. Um, at the same time, we, we, try, we have also tried to urge telephone and internet service providers to halt turning off these services as well. Um, but these companies are not regulated in the same way. Uh, that utilities are. And so we've been putting together a national coalition of attorneys general to urge phone companies and internet service providers to do more to protect their consumers um, when people are struggling financially and of course need their phone and internet services as, as much as ever and as much as they need those, those utilities. Um, you may have heard about an executive order um, that we worked on with the governor related to um, supporting chief justices um, order on halting evictions, um, which have, which are sort of following the, the path of the courts and the postponement of court proceedings. Um, and we also encourage sheriffs to delay performing any evictions um, based on any orders that may have already been um, issued. Um, also, we um, sent about 100 letters, and we're getting more complaints about this every day, um, to hotels and motels, um, letting them know that they are, they are also um, prohibited from threatening to evict North Carolinians who are living in hotels and motels as their primary residence. Um, so if you're being evicted um, during this state of emergency, please contact Legal Aid of North Carolina um, or a private attorney um, to get help. Um, we also have been working uh, with a lot of our colleagues across the country in attorneys general's office, offices um, to urge the federal government to make it easier for people to enroll um, uh, at, um, at healthcare.gov. Um, and so if you want to learn more about special enrollment periods related to that, um, you can see that information on, on healthcare.gov. Um, a, a lot of the work that we do, as you may know, is related to consumer protection. Um, the North Carolina price gouging statute is in effect right now. Uh, we have a, a, a pretty strong uh, statute against price gouging, which is basically charging too much money in a time of crisis. Um, if you are aware of price gouging that's taking place right now during the pandemic, you can go to ncdoj.gov slash price gouging to file a complaint. And we've currently received about 1,500 different um, price gouging complaints related to the pandemic. Um, nearly 75% of those are related to the prices of groceries, health products, or cleaning products. Um, so that's obviously very upsetting. I'm sure that all, all of us know the experience of trying to find some of these products for our own homes and, and some of the, the um, wild things that we're seeing, particularly online, related to those, to those, um, those products. Um, we also are always on the lookout for scams. Um, our consumer protection folks are always getting information about different scams. We have alerts that you can sign up for on our website. Uh, I would say to be particularly aware of door-to-door -door scammers um, or anyone selling testing kits, um, miracle cures, or other things that are unsolicited. Uh, robocalls um, are still a thing um, in texts and phishing emails. Um, so always stay vis vis vigilant with regard to those things. Um, and as I said, you can sign up for alerts based on the new things that we're hearing from our consumer protection line um, online. Um, the federal stimulus money is another place where um, our, our office has been active. Not only are there scams that we've, we've seen related to this money as people start to receive it, um, but um, so um, we also uh, want to make sure that Debtor, uh, debtors don't take that money when it's needed to help people to um, stay in their homes and help to stimulate the economy. Um, so you can get more information about your stimulus at irs.gov slash coronavirus. Um, and as we try to figure out how we can um, make sure the money is used in the way that it was intended, um, we're looking at what, what um, avenues we have under North Carolina law to really protect um, this money and make sure it's used in the way that it was intended and not to, not to go to pay um, debts. Obviously, you know, people will, will have to pay the debts eventually, but this, we, we feel strongly that this is not the time um, to have people paying debts when they really need to be making sure they can meet the basic needs of their families. Um, a, 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 a few other things I wanted to highlight for you. Um, we know that uh, people are all socially distancing. We hope they are, and they're staying home. And so kids are online uh, more than ever for school, for fun, um, for sanity for their parents. Um, and we, um, we, we um, have partnered with 
um, Shield North Carolina and the North Carolina Coalition Against Human Trafficking to develop a one-page guide that identifies steps that families can take to improve online safety and to protect their kids online. Um, that is also available on our website, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll circle back about, I'll uh, provide that afterward. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to highlight the issue of domestic violence. Um, we are seeing that um, as you might expect, some, some areas of crime are down during the pandemic because people are at home. Um, but domestic violence is an area that we believe is up in part because people are home. Um, and so we um, have been partnering closely with the courts and with uh, the Attorney General has partnered closely with Chief Justice Sherry Beasley um, on trying to increase and, and make sure, not only make sure that uh, victims and survivors have access to the courts, but to increase increase and improve their access to the courts as we try to, to figure out ways that remote proceedings can take place in terms of protective orders um, and things like that. So that they, they uh, released a joint statement on that that could be found on our, on our website. And I, I also just wanna take this opportunity to say that if you, um, if you need help, if you're in a domestic violence situation, please, um, you can get that help 24 seven um, at the domestic violence hotline, 1-800-799-7233. So I think that is just about my time and I'm sorry if I talked too quickly. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I wanted to remind everyone that um, this event uh, is being recorded. So um, we're gonna go pretty quickly through the agenda, but we're hoping to have smaller conversations on these topics in the future. So um, please know that there'll be a time for questions and answers. So. Um, please, as we're going along, if you have questions, please write them down and uh, we'll get to those and then we'll go on. I just wanted to provide some information about where we are in terms of the cases that we are seeing so far. Um, what's important to know is not so much the numbers, but uh, how many there are and that the uh, trajectory is going up. So when I last looked at this data, um, well, when I did the last presentation, it was on April 9th. And on April 9th, uh, you can see the data here, there were 3,221 cases in North Carolina with 46 deaths. You see the number of tests that were completed, 41,000, currently hospitalized, 354, and the number of counties that were impacted, 90 counties out of the 100 counties that we have in North Carolina. The top three counties in terms of uh, 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 COVID-19 um, cases were on uh, April 9th, Mecklenburg, Wake, and Durham. And you can see the numbers there, 810 Mecklenburg, 336 Wake, 205 in Durham. There were six deaths in Mecklenburg County, zero in Wake County, and one in Durham County at that time. And this is where we are today. So let me just back up again, 3,000. And here we are this morning, April 21st, 6,951, 213 deaths. The number of tests uh, completed the number of counties, 93, so three more counties have been added to the list. The other uh, thing that has literally jumped in this short period of time, not only do you see all of the numbers going up uh, for the counties that I mentioned, Mecklenburg, Wake, and Durham, but suddenly Wayne County um, has surpassed Durham in terms of the number of cases and Goldsboro, for example, is in Wayne County. So that gives you a little bit of a reference. So we're not out of the woods. Um, we're still going up in terms of seeing the cases of coronavirus. And so we do need to practice um, our distancing, six feet, and those kinds of things. So in terms of race and ethnicity, uh, what I have for you here are the numbers of um, uh, individuals that have presented with coronavirus, white, black, and Hispanic. On April 9th, 1,175 white individuals, 28 deaths. And then April 21st, 2,795 with 120 deaths among black people. 
785 on April 9th with 13 deaths. And now on April 21st, 2059 with 74 deaths. Hispanic, 154, one death, 498 today um, with five deaths. And so um, you can see what's happening in terms of these numbers. So again, um, regardless of what you're hearing, and please listen to the scientists, we have medical professionals uh, on the line tonight, but I, I just want you to understand that some of the myths that you might have heard in terms of Black people not getting coronavirus or some of the other things that are out there, uh, we'll have a chance to talk about those as well. Uh, confirmed cases by age. This is really important, especially for those, I was going to say, for those of us who are ages 25 through, through 49, but that is not the case. <laughs> Our oldest child is 44, so that wouldn't work. Um, but it's important to look at this slide in terms of um, the younger people that have confirmed COVID-19. Uh, and you see that the age is 25 to 49. Uh, and that hasn't changed much between April 9th and April 21st. Uh, and then you see the numbers of individuals 65 and over, 20% uh, on April 9th, 25% on April 21st. And so, you know, we are concerned about seniors, um, but we also need to make sure that seniors are protected uh, from their grandchildren or younger people in their family. So we can't just go visit grandma, auntie, uncle, at this time because we might unintentionally um, uh, infect others. But when it comes to the deaths by age, April 9th, April 21st, then even though uh, folks who are 25 to 49 years old are more likely to contract the virus, it's the individuals that are seniors that um, will die more most likely, or more often, I should say, um, from the illness. Uh, on April 9th, 80%, April 21st, uh, 85%. So we need to keep these numbers in mind. I'm hoping that um, uh, sometime soon we'll be able to get, get information from the health department on uh, the individuals uh, uh, according to race um, that have been tested, that uh, have died and that kind of thing. And perhaps we can hear that from Mr. Jenkins a little later on. We, there are enough ventilators in North Carolina and there are enough hospital beds right now to deal with the virus. It's not like we've seen across the country. So we need to make sure that when we're looking at data from other states and other cities, that we're not thinking that the same thing is happening here. What's happening here is difficult enough and I don't want to uh, make it seem that there's not a problem. The number of folks that, are, uh, that have the virus and those that are dying, of course, those are important numbers that we have to pay attention to. But we in North Carolina and in Durham need to make sure that we're doing whatever we can in order to protect ourselves and those that we love. And so next we will hear from Dr. Hart Brothers, who will talk to us about uh, the coronavirus in terms of senior citizens and vulnerable populations. Welcome. Good evening. I'm Elaine Hart Brothers. I'm an internal medicine physician and I practiced for years. I have my license, but I'm working now as the director of the Community Health Coalition, which I co-founded in 1989. Healthy People 2000 was starting then. Now we're launched Healthy People 2030. So our vision is a society with all people live long, healthy, active lives, full of purpose and promise. And that kind of comes from Healthy People uh, 2010. So we are striving 
for health equity with our partners. We have a lot of partners and of course, eliminating racial health disparity has been something we've always worked toward in Durham and the surrounding areas. So thank you. Now the COVID virus is new. And so that's why it's called COVID-19. It's 2019, it started. And I would be interested as we start to do tests later with antibodies, if some of the serum was saved on the early cases and, and people who died of other things, if we could test to see if the antibodies were positive, if that virus really was around the world on a low level. Supposedly it came from um, animals and bats in China. And that is known to happen where a virus or, or a organism will jump from one species to another, but it's, it's really fascinating. The signs and symptoms we should go over because that can influence whether you get tested or not. And just hopefully someday we'll have more tests. But uh, the symptoms, as you know, are uh, shortness of breath, dry cough, sometimes just a sore throat, headache. And it can be a little confusing. The body aches, they said, are more with the flu, but it, people get body aches pretty severe with COVID-19, very, very tired, and they can have nausea and diarrhea because the virus attaches along the mucous membranes in the throat and nose and in the lungs, bronchial airways, but also other places in the body and including the GI tract. So nausea and vomiting is actually part of it. Uh, incubation period is variable. And there's a lot of things we don't know about this disease. This is a very basic concept, this incubation period. From one day up to 14 days, and usually people will get sick five to six days after exposure. And sometimes they feel a little better then they get sick again. So that's what we need to know about. And, and then my task was to tell you about the vulnerable population. And thank you so much, Wanda, for uh, getting the panel together and those statistics you just showed. That's really so important to see it in the graph like that. Why the elderly? Well, you know, it's not so much that they have immune problems as you would think their immunity is down. It's more because they have other underlying conditions, underlying diseases, and that's the same reason why people of color have been so devastated with the underlying conditions, such as hypertension, cardiovascular disease, even more than diabetes. It's heart disease, heart failure, hypoventilation. That means you don't ventilate and take a deep breath. And obesity, people who are very obese or moderately obese, BMI of over 30, 32, they don't have quite the ventilation. So that's again something that connects with uh, people of color. Um, elderly can be dehydrated. They have other problems such as urinary retention and end up with more kidney problems. Uh, they don't move around as much. And if they're isolated in say a nursing home, you can imagine a person can go from home to home or visit them and spread it very quickly in the facility, just like hospital nosocomial infections. Inadvertently, doctors, nurses, x-ray techs, phlebotomists will spread from one room to the other. But that's what's happened in nursing home. Um, also, they have a, a, a reaction to drugs. They're also already on medicines for chronic diseases. And some of that may uh, lead to more viral illnesses. And uh, nutrition is an issue for elderly and for our, our people. So it's a, sometimes it's a little bit of a, um, not a surprise that uh, people get pneumonia and, and blacks tend to get sicker for certain diseases. And, um, same thing with the elderly. Okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to mention was, of course, the statistics for Blacks. And the way to look at, look at it is per 100,000 people. So we looked at those numbers climbing in our own state, but it's been devastating, as you all have heard on the news. Chicago, poor Louisiana with um, New Orleans, and other cities. Not so much New York City, although Latinos are having uh, disproportionate and Blacks, but only a little bit of disproportionate to the population. 
Um, 70% of COVID deaths involve Black individuals, but they only made up 30% of the population in Chicago, and 32% of the state's population in uh, Louisiana, but something like 70, 70.5% of the deaths. Um, so per 100,000, and this gets to be kind of statistics, but it's a good way to look at it. Uh, 137.5 per 100,000, our, uh, our director would know that's a huge number. And the rate is more than threefold higher for the infection rate with Blacks, but the death rate can be as high as six times higher compared to predominantly white counties, communities, and pockets. It can be six times higher for the Blacks per 100,000 than it is for whites. Okay, now what do we do about it? Unfortunately, there's no easy answer. Washing hands, washing hands, washing hands. Wear a mask. Don't be crazy and go out. Can you believe in Georgia they've opened up beauty salons pretty soon and even tattoo parlors? That is not essential. <laughs> Barbers, I know black people are going to be going to the hairdresser. You have to use common sense and protect yourself and others. Like she said, you're protecting your family as well as yourself. Staying distance, uh, one person was saying from Harvard, it's physically spacing. It's not so much social spacing. If you have internet and phones and you can socially talk, it's physical spacing. And seven feet, nine feet, maybe you know, better than six feet for cough, sneezes, and the droplets. Um, it's not an aerosol disease, by the way, and people have asked that. So how much time do we have? Is that about it? That's about it, but we'll have... Okay, now here's what I want to say. <laughs> I want to say don't smoke and keep healthy habits. And if you allow me to, to read this little uh, rhyme that I made. We had to get ahead of it. We need to slow the spread of it. We need funds, not charity, and community solidarity. Mm. Healthy habits we need to do, and more testing is needed too. A healthy Durham includes you. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. You can hear the cheers <laughs> from that. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Ruby Long, help us out, please, about what's happening in the ER. <laughs> and you have to take your phone off, your computer off mute. So I'm a board certified emergency physician or ER doctor, and um, I work in several different towns in North Carolina, mostly um, on the Eastern coast. And first, I just want to say thank you for putting this together and thank you for having me. Next, I want to tell you about what I see and kind of what might happen if you come to the emergency department. Um, but in all reality, there is no cure yet for this thing. And this thing is vicious. It's like the green berets of the fighting germs. It is very intense. And what I say that, um, when I go to the hospital, usually I see patients come in and often there are three or four people with their loved one or the patient that's sick. And so at this point, people usually have lots of coats, bags, purses, all these things with them. No mask on their face. and um, maybe just a lot of trinkets. And so when I really think about it, I really wish that I only saw one patient or one person plus maybe a support person for that patient because every person that comes to the hospital is putting themselves at risk of possible infection. COVID or the coronavirus or Rona is real right now, but there are other germs that are out there too. So what I wish I saw would be even before you got to the hospital, before you got to our front door, that you have your mask on um, and that maybe you have your ID, your, your health insurance card and your photo ID in one bag, like a little sandwich bag and um, your cell phone in another sandwich bag. You can actually hear 
through your cell phone if it's in a sandwich bag, but at least this way you won't get all the germs from the outside environment on it. And you don't have to worry about cleaning it as so thoroughly. So I wanna do a little exercise where we practice a bit. This is a NASCAR state. So I want us to get in a NASCAR mood and I want us to think about this like we are really high tune performing machines. I'm gonna call this the Nana drill because that's what I call the senior lady in my life. And so what I want you to do is, even before you get to the hospital, have one person that's gonna be the point of contact to relay information between Nana and the doctor and the family. Um, and particularly if you have your cell phone, you can take this into the room with you and do FaceTime or put it on speakerphone while the patient is being examined and you can have your other family members on the other side of the line listening. That way, everybody knows what's going on, but there is only one person really being exposed to the germs in the hospital. And when you first get to the hospital, somebody hopefully will meet you at the front door and they're gonna meet you and ask that you put on a medical mask because if there's a chance you have a germ, you don't want to spread it to other people. Um, and more importantly, if you get close in contact with somebody else, you don't want those germs to get on you. Now, this is probably one of the first times you might question people and ask what they're doing. But guaranteed, this is probably the first time they're not approaching you because you're Black. They're approaching you because they want to make sure you don't have the coronavirus. Or if you do, we take you to an area where we can limit the spread of the germs. And so you might find that if you come to the hospital with fever, cough, shortness of breath, that you'll be directed to maybe a tent or to another freestanding building. And a lot of hospitals are trying to keep all the patients with respiratory or the corona symptoms together. So that way the whole department isn't infected or um, reduces the risk of infection and contagion amongst everybody. Now, once you get to the backside where you're getting treatment, they're gonna check your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your oxygen levels. If you um, have low oxygen, which is the big reason why people are passing away or dying from this virus, one of the big reasons, you might get some oxygen in your nose called a nasal cannula. And hopefully they will put a mask on top of that too. Because as you get air currents that blow oxygen up, sometimes the virus can be spread. And so we wanna try and contain all those germs in one little area. You might even hear somebody say something like, can you lay on your belly for me? Or can you lay on your stomach? And that is technically called proning. And what that does is, it takes all the weight from the front of our chest, our breast, our pecs, you know, with some very buff people out there, off of the lungs. And it allows your back to be exposed towards the ceiling. And this helps get lots of fresh air and oxygen into the parts of the lungs that can really help you breathe easier. Um, and at this point, if those things are no longer working, you may hear people talk about more invasive sort of machines. Now you might wonder, well, can't they just give me a medicine, an antibiotic for this? Well, first, antibiotics are for bacteria and um, there's nothing proven yet to really make this virus go away. There are like 90 trials going on, but nobody has found the, the definitive cure yet. Um, so just know that you're not getting a medicine because it may not be available or they're saving it for the extremely sick people who they may be testing these medicines on. Um, and the next thing, if you have the oxygen in your nose and that's not working well enough, you might hear someone say, I think we might need to intubate you or intubate your loved one, your family member. And what that means is to help put somebody on life support to breathe for them and connect them to the ventilator machine so that their lungs can receive oxygen most oxygen and it also helps you blow off that carbon gas or other things and so you might kind of look like i don't know about using your machines i got a cpap machine at home i got a bipap machine at home can i just use that and be okay and technically that does help people with oxygen and breathing problems but in this current situation where we don't have enough protective um, personal protective equipment like those N95 masks or even surgical masks, 
you may not see those machines used. One, because every time you get a high puff of air towards somebody's face, those germs go flying. And they say at least six feet. They say at least six feet. But we know that's not the case. These germs go very far. So we want to do as much as we can to protect everybody. And um, then if the, so the BiPAP may not work, or sometimes if you go to the hospital, you get a nebulizer to help open up your emphysema or your COPD. You may not see that used right now because that too is like high pressure oxygen and it's gonna cause the germs to kind of float all around. And so what you'll see is a lot of people getting inhalers and if the inhalers and the nasal cannula don't work, we're definitely going to the ventilator. And the reason for that is once somebody's on a ventilator, it keeps all the germs locked into one little circuit, which makes it honestly safer for everybody that provides care for you. Um, and I know there's some debate out there about these ventilators. Do they work? Do they not work? The whole point is to have people that are really smart, really savvy working these machines so that they are keeping an eye on you and maximizing how much oxygen you get without causing extra pressure or damage to your lungs. And so I want you to know if you hear of somebody that needs to be put on life support or a ventilator, it's likely they'll be on there for a while, probably a week and a half, maybe even two weeks. So don't lose hope, but also know that this is a very serious illness and it takes a long time for people to heal and potentially recover. And so lastly, oh shoot, I just, oh shoot. <laughs> My throat hurts. I think oh, I have a fever. You know what? You know what? <laughs> We're all I, I gotta go to the hospital, y'all. I checked on the CDC's website. They have a little thing to ask you to, to check your symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath. <coughs> you feel so weak, you're about to pass out. Those are the reasons you need to go to the hospital. CDC checker. And if you want a corona test, don't just show up to the hospital. Call the health department. They can find a safe way for you to get tested. <coughs> don't put your hands up. <laughs> I'm going to the doctor. I got my sunglasses on. Wow. I got my mask. And you know what? When I get to the hospital, I have my cell phone in a plastic bag. By law, they have to see you. They're going to screen you. But if you can, bring your insurance card and maybe an ID. And these glasses are not just because I'm a sick, fine diva. It's because I also don't want droplets to get in my eyes. So it's not the very best, but anything you can do to decrease your chance of catching this virus will help you out a bit. So from one diva doctor to all my people out there, I really want you to stay safe. And you see this? I need to wash my hands. I just took my glasses off. I'm gonna take my mask off on the sides of my face and I'm gonna throw it away. Okay. I will not put that mask in my purse and I will not go retrieve it because everything that mask touch becomes contaminated. I genuinely love you all. I do not wanna see you at my hospital. I want you to stay safe and please feel free to ask questions. Thank you so much. Oh, that was awesome. So we're gonna have questions and answers afterwards. So make sure that you're ready for those. Thank you so much, Dr. Long. That was, that was not only wonderful, it was entertaining too, as has, have been our speakers so far. Well, Dr. Jonathan Livingston has uh, joined us. So he's gonna talk about cabin fever. <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm sure we're not feeling that way now, uh, Dr. Livingston, but uh, you can go ahead. Unmute your phone, uh, your device. Well, first and foremost, thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to folks about this. Mm -hmm. um, forgive me for being late to it. We were trying to get into the system, and I was on, on other meetings trying to uh, develop grants for COVID, 
uh, in regards to response. Now, most of us are experiencing some sort of cabin fever, whether it be uh, the intermittent times we go to the store, whether it be the lack of routine. One of the first ways to deal with the stress of COVID and cabin fever is to boost your immune system. Boost your immune system. Supplements like vitamin C, vitamin D, garlic, a lot of water. What we've seen out of Italy is that individuals who are drinking a lot of water and hydrating the organs. COVID is peculiar in that it's attacking a number of organs. And so warm water, drinking water, warm water to move the probable infection from the nasal cavity into the digestive system where you have acids that will kill it. But water is key. The other piece is making sure that you have a regimen of vitamin C, vitamin D, an old remedy that boosts the immune system that my grandmother and some of the old uh, individuals who were called colored in the day would use was that of uh, making sure that your digestive system is regular and you take garlic. C uh, fish oil is pretty good as well. Because we are all under stress, the stress attacks our immune system, thus making us more susceptible to these types of diseases and pandemics. We have to remember that there is an interaction between the psychological and the biological. So the number one thing to deal with the, the cabin fever Boost your immune system, the exercise, the walks, the water, making sure you're taking vitamin supplements. The other piece, number two, structure your day. Structure your day. When this uh, disease broke out, my students will tell you, I was at the Trap Museum in Atlanta. I'm on a student trip, student conference. I want to go and take them to the Martin Luther King Center. But it is such a great job, I'm in the trap museum. And most folks know I like rap music about as much as, uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but there, once we begin to see this disease progress, it was important once I got the kids back here that they set up routine, meaning continue to go to class. If you're able to work from home, set up a schedule for yourself the routine, the consistency will keep you going and keep you away from thinking about uh, the, the numbers on TV, the debates on Fox News. So setting up a routine. If you're not at work, it's important that you set up a routine, whether it be exercise, whether it be finding something that you like to do, Find, you know, working on a hobby, learning a new language. I see a number of people learning a new language other individuals uh, developing a new uh, exercise regimen or fixing up the house, doing something around the house, painting or doing your carpet. You gotta develop a routine so that depression won't set in. So it's incredibly important that you structure your day, have an agenda each day. The other piece, you got, we were told to social distance ourselves. And for those of us who have grandkids, we have kids, it's difficult. It's difficult. When it, they first started to lock down, the first thing me and most of us who are grandkids wanted to do, I want to go see my grandbabies. And in fact, mom, they just stay with me. <laughs> we, we can't put ourselves in jeopardy and we can't put others in jeopardy. So it's important that we also still maintain that social contact. Calling old friends, talking to old friends. I had a conversation with somebody I hadn't talked to since 1982. And you know how, how um, that, that does something to you. It takes you back to a place. It gets your mind off of COVID. So maintaining social contact, even a routine with that. I'm going to call this kid today. Let me check on this kid today. You know, I ain't talked to uh, Aunt Sue in a while. You know she got that sugar. Let me call and talk to her, which you know is going to take an hour. But it's good. It keeps you going. Because now you think about Aunt Sue. You know she cooked them pies. So maintain social contact. Do not isolate yourself. Number four, inside the house. What we've seen is an increase in domestic violence. We've seen an increase in violence against children. This has happened anytime you have an ecological event impact a contained area. We saw it in uh, the Midwest when the economic recession came. We've seen it after Hurricane Katrina. We saw it 
these domestic problems. Avoiding contact is key. Meaning, taking time to sit back, counting one, two, three. I'm stressed, this is a stressful time. Is this a time to deal with this or is this something I'll table later? Being introspective and self-aware in what we say to each other, how we say it, and particularly when we're in closed spaces, okay? Sometimes it's best to just isolate yourself. You go to another room, another part of the house when there's contention, when there's arguments, and you just let it go. And just like the common cold, the tension between individuals, it dissipates. So avoiding these conflicts will be critically important. Now, in terms of the other piece, we talked about the exercise, and that, that's the most difficult one, in particular for those of us who are seniors and still active shooting ball, and now that we can't, because it's a part of our mental, you know, I gotta go to the gym, I gotta work out, if I don't work out, I can't be Superman. Making sure that if you have an opportunity to work out in your home, creating a space where you can lift weights, where you can stretch, you can watch the TV, is critically important. Also, one of the things that, that, that I've done and I'm encouraging among many of our students is watching movies and laughter. Laughter is so therapeutic. Watching funny movies and just sitting back and laugh. And it, it releases these endorphins, your mood changes. Even if you were mad, sitting down and watching Kevin Hart or Cat Williams or what's the young lady named Tiffany Haddish, you, you laugh. I mean, I watched, uh, what's that, um, the movie about uh, them, uh, oh God, what's that movie, Girls Trip. I laughed the whole time. I forgot we had COVID, I laughed so hard. <laughs> These are things that we have to do in order to protect our mental. When we are under anxiety, we are under stress, it lowers our immunology. And what happens is we become more susceptible disease, to disease when we are stressed, when we are depressed. So I encourage folks, keep structure in your life. Use this time to work on your immune system, the zinc, the garlic, vitamin C. Carrot juice is amazing. Okay, carrot juice is amazing, in particular for that of the kidneys and the liver. Structure. If you don't have work, create it. This is that time for individuals who've been thinking about that business, you've been thinking about that book, you've been thinking about this, this, this record deal, this project, this is the time to do it. Begin to develop goals and plans so that you occupy your mind. We talk about an issue of avoiding conflict making sure that you're mindful of your psychological states and moods. If you are in anger, try to remove it with laughter, exercise. If you have a contentious issue with someone in a space, make sure if you're not in a space where you're ready to talk about it in a uh, measured and in a calm way, that you table it for another time. And being very direct and honest with each other is critically important. Folks, I believe we're gonna make it through this, but I'm more concerned about whether or not psychologically, what will be the impact. That's pretty much what all I gotta say, any questions? We're gonna take questions at the end. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your being on. And uh, it's really important, as you're saying, not only to think about our physical health, but to think about our emotional health, be health because cabin fever is real. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Robert Patterson, and he has a personal story of recovery from COVID-19. And I'm just so glad that you've recovered and, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate uh, uh, the opportunity to come and spread uh, some information that I have from a personal perspective uh, about the virus. Uh, just as by way of introduction, I'm a, a board certified psychiatrist, I'm staff psychiatrist at Eskenazi Hospital uh, in Indianapolis, where I do both um, mostly outpatient work, but some inpatient work as well. The inpatient work is uh, probably um, 
uh, the vector for for this uh, for my uh, catching COVID. By the way, uh, I was asked to be here uh, by my fellow um, Indianapolis alum, Dr. Long. So I appreciate the opportunity. She she knew from Facebook that I had uh, recovered from my battle with COVID, and so as soon as I was able to, I guess. Uh, get my wits about me, she put me to work. So I appreciate that putting me to work. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I guess I wanted to start off and just talk about um, things that will probably um, help you and your family do everything you can to avoid this because uh, by giving you the information of, of what I went through. Um, as I've kind of briefly mentioned before, uh, I believe that, uh, well, I, I believe I contracted uh, the virus on March 21st, uh, which was a Saturday uh, not too long ago. Uh, I, the reason why I feel like I can reasonably narrow it down uh, is because I was um, working on an inpatient unit. Uh, and so uh, I was uh, exposed to a patient that w was found later uh, to have uh, been positive for COVID. Um, and I will say that I was a little uh, bit um, upset about being put into that position uh, because while I was walking on the unit at this time, there weren't the suggestions as, as far as wearing masks. Let, let's put it this way, there, there wasn't uh, basically an edict that said, yeah, you really should wear a mask. Um, despite that, uh, I wanted to wear a mask uh, and I had a mask uh, around my neck and I was prepared to wear it. I also was prepared to wear eyewear. But as I arrived to the unit, um, I was told by nurses uh, that they weren't allowed to, to wear a mask because they were told that it would um, affect the mental um, stability of some of the patients. And remember, I'm a psychiatrist, so we have patients who are, you know, in very paranoid states. So when you see people walking around with masks and things like that, that, that can be somewhat disturbing, but I don't know if that necessarily uh, overrides uh, the, the issue of safety. So I spent probably the first hour or so on the unit maybe less than that uh, without a mask. Again, a mask around my neck. And what I tried to do in, in support of what the nurses were going through since they couldn't wear masks was just to keep as much distance as I could from the patients, to keep six feet away from the patients and try not to face them directly. A as you might imagine, um, dealing with patients who are having significant psychological issues, um, that's difficult to do. Uh, so to maintain six feet worth of distance was almost impossible. They would continue to uh, walk pretty close to me. And then even when I would turn my body to a certain degree to, so that we wouldn't face each other directly, they would tend to turn with me. So, so at that point, I decided I'm just going to put my mask on. Uh, so I, I was only, it was only an hour and a half, I would say, that I was on the unit without a, a mask. And, and before I get into my story, I also want to say, interestingly enough, I actually, when I left the unit that night, I wrote an email to, to my, my staff uh, and I, I told them that the reasons why I felt we should wear masks. Uh, and I told them that, you know, everybody in the unit should wear masks. And, and I was talking about testing and a variety of other things. And a day or two later, they told me, they came to see me directly and they said, no, we really don't think you need to wear a mask. You, you'll be safe. Nothing's going to happen. Don't worry about it. Um, and then a day or two after that, uh, the edict came down that everybody in the hospital had to wear a mask. So that's kind of the setup for my, my situation. Uh, so the, again, March 21st is when I believe that this first, I was uh, exposed to it. On March 27th, 28th, um, I started to experience uh, a lot of muscle pain. And, and muscle pain, just my chest, my arms, my legs, everything seemed to hurt and, and kind of, um, uh, it, it was different than what I had felt before. But I thought that maybe because I'd, I'd been doing quite a bit of working out that maybe it was in response to my workout. So I, I, you know, I spent some extra time in the shower, tried to make myself feel a little bit better about it and just went to bed. Later on that night, um, I started to, experience what I now know are sweats and chills, but I just got cold in the middle of the night. And so 
I'm trying to figure out why I'm so cold, why am I putting on sweats in the middle of the night? And you would think I wasn't a doctor because <laughs> I really wasn't putting two and two together about what was going on. Um, but it, it wasn't until the, the following day um, that I began to have uh, to experience uh, headaches and just feel flush. I don't know if I would describe it as a fever, just feel flush. You know, every, I just felt like I was warm. And so then I, I went and I got my uh, thermometer out and sure enough, my, my temperature was around 101. It was probably a little bit higher than that. Um, we'll, we'll get to this at the end, but you know, I do wanna tell you that one thing that you definitely should have is you should have a thermometer uh, that you're re there's reliable in your house. We had one thermometer, still have one thermometer, as you know that they're in, in, in great demand right now. And it was a kitty thermometer that had a little bear at the end of it. Now I'm sure that has absolutely no bearing on how uh, well it worked, but it mentally for me, I just thought this wasn't a good uh, thermometer, so it's probably not working well. But every time I took my temperature, it was between 101 and 102. Um, then I, by this time, I, I realized that I was in trouble and that I probably had contracted the virus. So then I began to isolate myself uh, in this basement that you see me sitting in, in now. Um, uh, what happened next was fever, uh, I'm sorry, fatigue. Uh, fatigue, like uh, you would not believe, that really uh, came over me and just really put me down and put me in a position where I didn't have the ability to be able to recover from it well. Um, my body continued to ache. I had lots of sweats and chills, blinding headaches uh, to the point where I just felt like I couldn't focus on what was going on. Uh, and by that time, I, I worked with my doctor to get myself in a position where I could get a test. Went to Eli Lilly and, and got a test. Eli Lilly is a, an organization, a pharmaceutical company here, and got the test. I will tell you this, the experience with the testing is... Um, uh, probably one of the most uncomfortable things I've, I've endured. Um, so um, to put the, 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 uh, the nasal pharyngeal, to put the, the uh, what is not the Q-tip, but I forget what it's called, into that area was just extremely um, uncomfortable, let's just say that. Uh, the following day, I got my test results. Uh, I was positive. So by this time, I had the virus for about a week, uh, and I started to turn the corner then. Um, I started to feel a little bit better, and, uh, but I still really didn't have much of a taste. Everything that I tasted was very much, um, oh, I mean, I can't even describe the taste. It was probably, felt like, it tasted like dirt and, and, and metal, everything. About the only thing that tasted like it should have tasted probably was, was an orange. Um, so again, I started to turn the corner then. I, I will tell you this, that over the, the five days that I really went through, the, the worst part of it, I lost 10 pounds uh, just because I couldn't eat anything. Uh, and so it really took me down pretty far. Um, after I got the positive result again, turned the corner, I uh, started to feel a little bit better. But then when I started to feel better, then the shortness of breath uh, took over. And I had never had that experience. That, that was what was I was concerned about the most of the time. I was really concerned about whether or not this was going to get to my lungs and I was going to have to go to be hospitalized and started on a ventilator. Um, but then the shortness of breath just came. Uh, it was pretty difficult for about two or three days. Felt like I was taking breaths through a straw. Uh, but eventually that passed um, and, I, and I felt much better. So I, I'm, I'm feeling fine now. Within a, I took a, another week off after that. Uh, I, I went back to my regular workouts and, I, and I, my regular workouts were just fine. So my lung capacity and everything like that is, is, is going the way it should be. Uh, at the end, I guess I, I just want to say, what would I recommend? Uh, I would recommend um, a working thermometer. Uh, I did probably didn't mention that uh, Tylenol I felt was a lifesaver. Uh, every time I took Tylenol, I, I felt a little bit better. The headaches went away and my temperature uh, went down to a certain degree. So I would do those things and, and certainly do all the social distancing and the uh, wearing of masks and washing your hands that everybody has uh, suggested. Uh, don't, um, don't gargle vinegar water thinking that that's going to cure the virus. That's not going to happen. Uh, and please don't blow a hair dryer up your nose, uh, as I've also read, 
which will cure the virus. So those will be my do's and don'ts. Um, it was a very unpleasant experience. It was by far the worst illness of my life. Mm. Um, and um, and, I, and I'm, in, in, I'm in pretty good shape. Uh, so uh, I would be con concerned and I would do everything I could to make sure that I avoided it. Ooh, thank you so much. Well, you really shared and we appreciate it. Oh my goodness. And I think it's important for all of us to understand what the experience is like so that we can protect the ones that we love. I mean, that's really what this is all about. Um, doing what we need to do in order to protect ourselves, but think about us as potential shedders of the virus um, and and will hopefully take more responsibility. You know, you know I, I think that's so important. Just one more thought I wanted to add yeah. to it. I did mention that on the 21st, uh, that was the day I felt I contracted it, didn't get symptoms until the 28th. On the 22nd, I went to visit my father, who's 80 years old and has COPD in mm. another state. And he wanted me to come in the house. He wanted me to sit on the porch. He, he thought that the whole thing was kind of overblown and ridiculous. We did not come on the porch. We sat six feet away from him or more. And we talked to him in the yard, never hugged him, <laughs> didn't do any of those things. He did not, he did not appreciate that. But then I came <laughs> down with, with the virus uh, seven days later. So he understands yeah. it now. And yeah. so he understands the, the, the element of safety. So if, you're, if your loved ones don't understand it, they don't understand it. I love you enough to say, in this case, I'm just not going to endanger you and I'm going to stay away from you and we'll just have to work it out later on. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. And um, now we'll move to Mr. Rodney Jenkins, who's the director of the Durham County Department of Public Health. So um, he's going to talk to us about testing and maybe share some data about what's happening with our Black population in Durham. So, um, Mr. Jenkins. Dr. Boom, before that, can you change your, um, your screen view? And then I think that the speakers will, will, will pop up in that um, where you have the panelists. Are you able to change your screen view? Yeah, great. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who was trying to send me that message. <laughs> okay. I think you're you're on mute, Mr. Jenkins. Yeah. Now. As many Zoom calls I've been on, you'd think I have this down pat by now, but goodness gracious. You. <laughs> oh my goodness. What I was trying to say is these are tough acts to follow, and I will say that I've enjoyed every minute of it from, from the tips to keep yourself sane of, you know, Brother Livingston to uh, Mr. Patterson. I, I visited Indy for the first time last summer, so I know exactly where Eli Lilly is. Oh, okay. And, um, I had a great time in Indy. It's a fantastic city, especially the downtown area. It is. It is. It's and, nice. And goodness gracious, Dr. Ruby and Dr. Elaine. Oh my goodness, theatrics, poetry. And Miss Jasmine, I, I've seen you before. I, I think I was at a, a reentry uh, festival or, or conference in, in 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 Raleigh, and you came and spoke to us. And what I, I think it was like at the last minute, and uh, I remember you. I remember you, but. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Boone, hope thank you. Hope it was okay. Yeah, it was great. It was great. It was great. It was great. Dr. Boone, thank you so much. And again, um, I hope this message finds all of you uh, very well, safely tucked away, and most certainly being socially distant. Thank you all for being uh, compliant. And uh, again, thank you to the Durham Committee on Affairs of Black People. Uh, I take pride in telling you all that um, I'm a former member of the Robinson County affairs of black people where Pat McCray was our chair and uh, she was just as fired up and passionate about our community and things that are happening to black folk and you know again it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I am Rod Jenkins and I'm the fairly new public health director. I started on January 23rd, I'm sorry January 13th and um, I don't think I've stopped yet. 
I think I've been busy. I've been on the move ever since. Um, we've been dealing with uh, this coronavirus. And again, we are pretty much uh, well into day 35 of our emergency operations um, center operations. And um, I've been personally involved with COVID-19's response for Durham since January 22nd. I was at a meeting, a uh, conference of um, state health directors conference, as we call it, and got pulled in by the state health director herself and said, you know, we need for you to come to this room right now. And it was the war room. And it has been on and popping ever since. So again, um, I thank you all for spreading the information, spreading the knowledge about COVID. Um, we have partnered with Durham County's Emergency Management Division, uh, where there, we're inside an incident command structure. I'm pretty sure those of you who are savvy know all about that. But public health is serving as a branch. So I guess you could say as the public health uh, director, I'm serving as a subject matter expert for this response. And I'm working with the elected leaders um, for better or worse uh, in terms of the stay at home orders. And, you know, we do know that it's an evidence-based strategy in order to keep uh, folks safe. Um, as Dr. Ruby said, there is no vaccine. There's no cure. So the only thing we can do is just be socially distant and practice good hand hygiene and do all the things, mask wearing, everything that she said was just spot on. I mean, even from taking off your mask with your fingers, I mean, right on point. And um, we thank you again. So we, we know this is a challenging time as far as being restrictive and, you know, kind of having to hunker down and, and stay put, but we guarantee you that, I can guarantee you that at an 18% community spread as of right now, it's working because we were at high, as high as 30% just a few weeks ago. So it's definitely working. Um, I've been tasked to talk about testing and, um, you know, the message is not a good one. Yeah, It's getting better. It is getting better. I'll be honest. It is getting better, but we're a lot better than we were uh, a month and a half ago when we were really in the thick of it. Testing uh, has been a challenge to be clear and upfront with you, but we truly are encouraged by the updates that we receive. There's like 40 some companies that are able to be uh, FDA approved in, within the past few weeks. But, uh, you know, just, just a short time ago, there were only two major players in the test market, and that was Abbott Labs and Roche Pharmaceuticals. Abbott Labs, just to tell you how real it is in the battlefield, Abbott Labs um, has reached out to just about every health department in the state of North Carolina. And they want to, you know, they want to converse and they want to begin a dialogue. And we begin that dialogue only to find that there are 7,000 people in queue or entities in queue ahead of us. So that was uh, a little discouraging, but nevertheless, we do know that the state has test kits, but unfortunately, you almost have to be, and again, it's important for me to be upfront with my people, you have to be in crisis in order to receive those kits. What do I mean by crisis? I mean that you have to be inside a long-term care facility or a congregate setting where there are, uh, by the state's definition, an outbreak, which is two or more lab confirmed cases of positive cases of COVID and the potential to spread through an area is high. So even with that, you still have to force the state's hand in order to get you kits. So those are the things that we're up against. But again, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, we did receive reports that LabCorp did receive emergency FDA approval for their in-home test. They call it the Pixel, and it's going to allow for home testing after a uh, consultation with a clinician and approval of a clinician. So that's certainly um, encouraging. Most recently, uh, Governor Cooper did outline his um, strategy to reopen the state. And the approach is definitely going to be what we call a triple T approach, which uh, involves testing, tracing or contact tracing, and trends or trending. 
So the state has dedicated uh, work groups uh, around testing. And those work groups uh, really, really are focusing on how to rapidly ramp up access to testing so we can get away from community mitigation in the form of standing at stay at home orders. And, you know, they definitely want to drastically improve what they're doing and it's there uh, as evidenced by LabCorp's quick turnaround times. At one point in time, I mean, it, it took forever to get your results back. Now LabCorp can get your results back in as little as, you know, 24 to 36 hours. So that's definitely encouraging. But again, as um, Dr. Ruby said, these tests are still considered to be biosafety hazardous. So they require PPE or protective, um, personal protective equipment. And again, there's still supply chain issues to be resolved and the different you know, issues continue to go on and on. So what are we doing at Durham Public Health? So glad you asked. Our testing has focused on long-term care for long-term care facilities and congregate living areas. And as, uh, as uh, Dr. Wanda requested, we do have some data fresh off, hot off the press, uh, because every Tuesday and Thursday, we brief elected officials in the form of what we call a multi-agency coordination call. And we just kind of give them up close and personal information about what we're doing here during public health. So again, where we're seeing COVID run rapid is everything that, every, I mean, everything that Dr. Elaine just, just said, it's in the older individuals, those who are in long-term care facilities who have underlying health conditions. It pains me to say that today we are now in number six death. We've had six people to die. The result have been those individuals who are over the age of 65 with underlying health conditions, and just about every one of them were in long-term care facilities. So some, st some statistics for you. We found that those who are residents or staff at long-term care facilities represent 59% of our cases, or 84 people total. We also found that Long-term care facilities continue to be the focus of our nation. So of course, effective April 19, 2020, all outbreaks, we're saying all outbreaks in long-term care facilities have to be reported directly to the CDC. Unprecedented, this, this has never happened. So the CDC will in turn get directly involved with these long-term care facilities as far as working out mitigation strategies, making sure that they have adequate staffing, and ensuring that they're able to recover. Something, something that's probably near and dear to Dr. Ruby is that the CDC has put out guidance that if someone is asymptomatic and is positive for COVID, they can still work. They still can work inside these long-term care facilities. So again, that, that presents a whole myriad of other issues. However, it's important to note that these are in these are changing times, rapidly evolving times, but they can still work inside these long-term care facilities, but they have to work in those wings that are COVID positive wings because they are already positive. But we're finding that these long-term care facilities are um, having tremendous staff shortages. But again, I just wanted to bring that up because again, this is the area where uh, black folks are really, really uh, dying and being affected in strong numbers. In order to focus on seniors living in the long-term care facilities, we have formed a long-term care facility strike team. And that's a combination of public health nurses and registered sanitarians in order to, for them to go into these facilities, identify what they're doing wrong and try our best to provide that guidance for them to find the errors in their ways, fix the problems fast and try to mitigate the, the rampant spread inside these areas. Um, additionally, the state has um, provided us with a long-term care facility toolkit uh, for local health departments to use, and those informa that information came out today. In terms of race and ethnicity as of today, um, in terms of hospitalizations because of COVID, um, 
Blacks or African Americans, they represent 147 total cases of hospitalizations from the cases that we've had. Actively right now, 20 people are hospitalized and we've uh, already experienced four deaths within the African American community because of COVID. And those are statistics that are, that are real. So out of six, six deaths, four of them were African Americans and they're all in long-term care facilities. So you can see that heightens my need for focus, greater focus on long-term care facilities in Durham County. Um, 33% of our confirmed cases, again, identify as Black or African American. And again, that, that represents um, out of 14% um, is white, 8% of the cases that um, represent um, our brown brothers and sisters, Hispanic or Latino. 71% or 20 people, as mentioned, are currently hospitalized. And that's out of a total of 28 people who are, total 28 people who are hospitalized in Durham County. As far as uh, additional hospitalization information, the average age is 66, 45% are female, 55% are male, and again, 75% are associated with school nurse, skilled nursing facilities or long-term care facilities. So again, that heightens the need for public health to really hunker down. I'm proud to say that we have partnered with Duke um, Duke's Infectious Control Department. Um, Dr. Cameron Wolf, who runs that area, he's been wonderful. He's been wonderful. Um, I have personally, uh, Dr. Patterson, I've personally gone into a long-term care facility, full PPE, because it's important to lead from the front. I can't ask my staff to go if I'm not willing to go. So I've gone in and see how, you know, one facility that is the epicenter of our outbreak in um, Durham County to see exactly what they were doing, how they segmented staffing, how they're cleaning and everything. And there was some major work to be done. There, there, there was major work to be done. Um, a lot of our facilities are older facilities. Um, a lot of them have like staffing issues. So, you know, again, that's concerning. That's very concerning. So I'm glad that the CDC is stepping in in an effort to try to uh, mitigate this and, and to kind of bring a little additional expertise. Um, we, uh, we also reached out to um, uh, Katie Galbraith, who is the um, head of uh, Duke, Duke, Duke Regional, and we wanted to know what were their plans for mobile testing and community testing, because I know this is uh, something that we need desperately. And um, again, I know they have the resources and testing capacity they're currently in talks of um, trying to get that done. And um, I do know that um, in Mecklenburg, there's Atrium. And in uh, Guilford County, there's Cone Health. And they're all like either actively doing um, mobile testing, community testing, or they have plans on doing it. So why not do it here in, Duke, uh, in Durham? Again, if we are going to uh, propose to reopen the economy, reopen the uh, state, then we got to be able to test on a widespread level. Um, I have been encouraged by the fact that um, today, the United States Senate approved 484 billion in another corona, coronavirus uh, relief package. And even though it's aimed at small businesses and hospitals, there is quite amount, you know, quite the amount of money. I, I'm thinking like upwards of 100 million that's dedicated for testing. So that's encouraging, that's encouraging, because, you know, again, this is the Rona, as, uh, as we call it, you know, me, me and my frat brothers call it the Rona. It doesn't know any color, it doesn't know any socioeconomic, it's an equal opportunity killer. It's real, it is so real. So we are encouraged that that, information, that, uh, that, that relief is coming. And we are certainly happy to, uh, to know that, uh, Durham County's government is behind us, commissioners, Board of Health, and we are prepared to catch that money and to do what we need to do to protect our residents. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be before you long, but I just want you to know that Durham Public Health is here to help. We are in the arena and we're, we're fighting and we're glad that you're along with us. And again, we're going to fight until this is done. 
And rest assured, it will be done. Mm -hmm. So I thank you again for having me. Thank you. Really appreciate all of your comments. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so now uh, we're going to open up for questions. I think that is Angie's. Um... <laughs> it is. It is, Dr. Boone. I don't see any questions. I see quite a few people watching, but I don't see any questions. So um, I don't know what you had um, in mind for a wrap up, but mm -hmm. I would like to maybe go around to each of the panelists, um, you know, for the people who may have joined in later. And if they can take 30 seconds or so and just share with us, with the community, what they would like for us to know, what we need to know. Just 30 seconds. So Jasmine, we're going to start with you in Hollywood Squares. Mm -hmm. OK, um, I, I, I suppose I would say that um, all of the uh, challenges, societal problems, legal issues that um, existed prior to this crisis um, are amplified now. Um, and so we just need to remain diligent on trying to find um, the best policy and, and legal solutions um, to the challenges that we see and our office is working really hard on that and we want to partner with the, the public on that and look forward to hearing from you about um, challenges that you're having and ideas that you're having and particularly if there are issues related to um, consumer protection um, be sure um, to call our office and, and let us know that sometimes um, we can't always help with what it is that you're asking about but we certainly um, will try. Jasmine, share with us what office uh, you work out of again. I work for uh, the North Carolina Department of Justice at the uh, um, Office of North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein, and we have an information page that um, on this pandemic at ncdoj.gov slash COVID-19, and it has a lot of the information that I shared at the, t at the top of this program. And Dr. Elaine? Your phone is on mute. Unmute your phone. Uh, thank you again. The Community Health Coalition is a nonprofit that's been around about 30 years. The website is chealthc.org. So we want you to stay as healthy as you can. Don't smoke, eat vegetables, exercise, get your mental health together. So this, this will pass, but we have this disparity and we have to advocate for closing the gap and not just talking about it. This has brought up the issue even more of health disparity. So we can't go back to just talking about it. We got to have some action. The uh, idea of opening up cities like in Atlanta, we have to fight against that. And there are some movements. And since Durham Committee of Affairs of Black People is a political movement, we got to make sure that the black people take this seriously and don't fall in the trap of uh, thinking they can go out, you know, and go to different parties and funerals and things like that. That would be very bad for the community. So the message of washing hands and wearing masks and staying in the house and staying away from people, that's gotta be promoted. Um, the other thing is don't smoke, the vaping and our young people are setting up for long-term lung damage. When this finally is over, we're gonna be in trouble with kidney disease and we already have lung disease. So I'm, I'm kind of pessimistic. We got a long way to go, probably a couple years, you know, before the vaccine. We have no treatment, no antiviral treatment, but stay healthy and hopeful and careful, C-A-R-E-F-U-L-L. -L. And thank you again. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Boone, I have one question for, for you and the other panelists. Any advice, recommendations for millennials and Gen Z? Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm sure there are others who um, <clears throat> can speak to this as well. Um, but in addition to being um, chair of the Safety and Health Subcommittee for the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, we also have a college try adult and youth coalitions where um, we are at this time um, supporting all of the information that you've heard so far, but having uh, talks every Saturday um, for adults separately, teenagers separately, 
um, young children, seven to 12 separately, not only to um, speak to cabin fever, mental health, but talking about substance use, um, suicide prevention. Um, and in terms of Gen Z, which is a little bit older, um, the concern is, well, uh, as I spoke to in my first slides, the uh, dangerous age for coronavirus is 25 to 49. And so when we think about uh, young people who are in that population, then we have to stress um, distancing and um, and I, you know, I don't want to call it social distancing because what we're doing tonight is social. <laughs> so physical distancing. Um, take care of your mental health. Don't use substances. Don't uh, drink alcohol, uh, even though you feel like it may help you to feel better. You have to stay on a routine. Uh, there are other ways to exercise. Um, and as you think about your health in this way, this is really a time where we all have the opportunity to um, create a refreshed way of looking at our health so that when we do reach that senior age, we won't be those statistics who are suffering most often. Um, and be involved in getting the message out. So you have Facebook, Instagram, Snap, Snapchat, uh, TikTok, <laughs> um, use all of those um, uh, social media tools to get the message out to your peers so that they can carry the message along as well. So anyone else want to speak to that? Hey, this is Dr. Hey. Long. <clears throat> I'm an ER doctor in North Carolina. Um, this is not the time to go to the club, people. Let me just be very honest with you. Your hair may have to wait just a little bit, but until we have more testing, please limit your physical spacing with other people. If you notice, there's a catch. They say at least six feet. We know this virus can travel further than that. So be careful. But lastly, I want you to do it with a little flair and I want you to do it with a little style because we make everything fabulous and so there's no difference between being healthy we are always fly so every time whoops i'm trying to put my mask on i'm gonna not touch the front of my face every time you go somewhere make sure you have your mask on over your nose this this is not protection do not touch here. Take your mask off here and your eyewear, take them off on the sides as well. Wash your hands afterwards. But lastly, we are not out of the woodworks yet. As you see more people integrating through the community, we will likely see more spikes. So don't think that this is done. There is more sickness to come. But if you're very smart and use all your common sense, you can stay safe. And lastly, you better vote for people that have your interest at heart. And you better vote for people that look like you because there are some policies being made about who gets the life support, who does not get the life support and who gets the test. And so those things I really implore upon you to take care of yourself and take care of your community. Absolutely. Is there another, thank you so much. Is there another question from your device? Well, I had a question for her, but also the Old North State Medical Society is trying to get involved. And we have a local doctors, dentists, and pharmacy organization. So we do want to use our expertise and politically. But some people think we should be issuing pulse ox. But I don't know if they're accurate. The little ones that you can buy for people's homes or high risk people. Is that a good idea or not? No comment, really. Um. Well, because they're I'll short of breath, but they don't realize the oxygen level is so low. Right. So some, some people say that we should have devices available to high risk people in their home, but I don't have a feeling for that, if it's accurate or not. So sometimes what I've seen, some people in New York, they are letting people discharge from the hospital with very low oxygen levels, levels that normally we would say 
you need to be in the hospital on oxygen. But there are times when patients are going with their pulse ox on their finger, the little device to measure your oxygen levels, and they will send you home with the temporary oxygen kit and have someone deliver more oxygen to you. Honestly, I feel that um, particularly Black people, we have a lot of other health conditions. So you don't even need to spend your money on that. If you cannot get up and walk around your chair or walk to your bathroom like normal, you have shortness of breath that is abnormal. You need to go to the hospital. Okay. Thank if you, you can do your normal activities, your shortness of breath is probably reasonable. But if you find any limitations in your physical self, go to the hospital. Thank you. Angie, do you have another Facebook question? No more questions at this time. Okay. So we will go to Dr. Livingston, your 30 seconds of advice that you would give. You have to unmute your device. I can't hear, we can't hear you. Oh, it's him. Oh, you're showing him where it is. <laughs> there it is, right there. Okay, I got it. I got it. Yeah, it, it, that was a challenge for me. Um, I came to uh, North Carolina Central uh, Transparencies and Macrofish. So this this has been a learning curve for me. First and foremost, I want to thank the panelists. Uh, and um, I also want to just let folks know that HBCUs, we've been at the business of challenging health disparities since 1906. This is not new. Du Bois at Clark Atlanta was looking at consumption and disease among African Americans. Now I say all of that in that uh, the focus on health disparities becomes more important, it becomes more salient now. And even though uh, PWIs get millions of dollars to solve our problems, I think it's imperative that HBCUs take the lead because we are nested in those communities. These are our aunts, these are our uncles, these are our grandmothers, and we know our people. And if anybody can do this kind of work, I think HBCU should be taking the lead. The other piece uh, in regards to Central, I wanted to indicate in regards to health disparities, we've been at it for about 20 years. Uh, Faye Calhoun, uh, uh, Dr. Kumar, and others have secured enough money for us to address diabetes, uh, breast cancer, cervical cancer, HIV AIDS, and other pre-existing conditions that make one more susceptible for um, COVID-19. Now, this year, just a shameless plug, we, uh, Dr. Boone, she uh, is a part of this. Uh, she did our town hall meeting on our play called Kites. It will be on drug addiction. But our play next year will be on pandemics and us. We can't let this happen again. We have to be vigilant. And so that play is, we'll, I'll be contacting each of you to talk about your experience because we're learning as we go. We use ethnodrama to educate people about health. It has been an effective tool at North Carolina Central for about 15, 20 years, where it is a synergy of the liberal arts and the arts and that of the sciences in order to create products that educate our people that about the disease, increase awareness, screening, and behavior change. Uh, so, and that play will be uh, coming out next year. Uh, Dasan Hansu, who is at uh, Carolina, will be the playwright, and uh, Crystal Taylor and Dr. Asabi will be directing it. And so I'll be contacting people to make sure that we've captured this last nine months so that we can create a play that will increase the likelihood that people will change health, they will diet, they will follow treatment regimen, they'll begin to think about wellness and what this continuum of health looks like so that when the next pandemic comes, we can reduce rates. And so uh, that's about all I got to say. Again, those, those major points I talked about, routine, avoiding conflicts, building that immune system, critically important. Folks, we will get through this, but this will not be the last. I just wanna make sure that folks know that this is our, those of us who work in the area of health, this is our time. And again, I thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Patterson.
wanted to follow up, reiter reiterate a few points that I made earlier. Um, we need to take this seriously. Um, I'm a pretty healthy individual, and I can tell you that it, it took a lot out of me. Again, I was off from work uh, a week after, uh, you know, I was, um, uh, I had basically turned the corner um, and, I'm, and I'm a pretty healthy person. Uh, please make sure that you have the things on hand that you need. Uh, again, working thermometer, uh, uh, Tylenol. Also make sure that you're checking in on your family members, uh, particularly people who may be living uh, alone, especially the elderly. Um, you know, I've heard some horror stories of, uh, um, of people's, uh, I guess, uh, fathers and father-in-laws uh, in one particular say, situation, a father-in-law who, who had been just short of breath for a day or two, and they caught him the next day and he, and he, had, he had passed uh, and he was COVID positive. So we've got to check in on people more so than we do uh, and just be vigilant and understand that this, this is very serious. But I agree with everyone. We'll, we'll make it through it. Thank you. And our uh, health director, Mr. Jenkins. I'd like to thank everyone again. And uh, this has been a great opportunity and all the panelists have been fantastic. And it's definitely good to see some I've met before. Or, you know, I look forward to working with each and every one of you. But I echo everything that has been said. This is real. And um, you know, as, as a health director, you know, again, we get the information fresh out. So as, as soon as like somebody passes away, we know. And we have uh, a mandate by law to report not only deaths, but we have to also report um, positive cases. And, um, you know, to see, I, I think I was, I was with uh, some staff and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ferocious note taker and to see a couple of weeks ago where we were at like 125, to now see that we're at 348, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And again, to see that, you know, we have now have six deaths. So, you know, again, but to, to, uh, to end on an upbeat note, um, I thank you all for being a part of public health because each and every one of you are also a part of public health because you all are promoting and you're spreading and you're educating. And we can't thank you enough. I personally have done everything that I can uh, to include forums like this, uh, radio spots on the light and a couple of other stations and uh, weekly, weekly video chats just to spread information about COVID to our people and to all people in Durham. I just want to thank you all for helping me to do that. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, we will get this done and we certainly can do it, Durham. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, oh, you had something to say, and then uh, I'll close. Go ahead, Dr. Long. Hey, it's Dr. Long. I just want you to know many of my tips are, I want you to consider them, even for the grocery store. Before you walk out of your house, you have your glasses and your mask. When you go into the post office or the grocery store, it's not necessary to take your whole purse this is not the time to break out your big like travel bag. Just put your credit card and whatever you need or some cash in a plastic bag. That way, when you go to the register and check out, you're only using these items. When you finish, you can wipe them off with hand sanitizer or just wash, you know, rinse them in the sink. The other thing, you have your mask, your glasses on and your cell phone is out. Please consider putting your cell phone in a plastic bag, particularly when you're in a public space. You can still hear through it, but there are so many little crevices around your phone that it's so hard to really get it clean well. So when you're out in public spaces, consider sandwich bags and take only the minimal things that you need. Excellent, thank you so Thank you, Dr. Long, for being on the front line and all your coworkers and the cleaning crew yeah. and the transport people. They're so brave. I know it's a job. Some people have to make some money and go to work, but it is dangerous and you're a real hero. Thank you. Yes, you are. We salute you. Jasmine, did you have your hand up to say something? No, okay. Um, so finally, uh, thank you all so much for joining us, those of you who are panelists and those who have joined by Facebook. The Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People, Health 
and Safety Subcommittee has been looking at and working on health disparities. Um, and so this is just another thing that we need to do and we need to uh, look at. So please know that um, this is not the only conversation. Uh, this is not the first conversation, but it certainly is one that we will continue through the work of the committee. <clears throat> So anyone that would like to join um, the health committee, we virtually meet um, the second Thursdays uh, at 6 p.m. and we can send an invitation out to you. <clears throat> one of the things that I did want to reiterate has to do with if you have a loved one that goes to the hospital, make sure that they have a charged up cell phone with them so that you're able to speak with them on the phone while they're hearing from their uh, medical team because they're not gonna be able, you're not gonna be able to go in with them. However, you will be able to hear some of the things that are being said. We need to learn how to advocate for ourselves. Um, and those are some of the tips that we'll be sending out as well. So I want you to know that this is not the end as everyone has said, and, and I will say, we will get through this together. Make sure that we're following all of the guidance and ordinances that have been put in place. And one of the things that I want to say out loud is that if you are a barber or a beautician and you have relatives, sometimes and somehow the message has been misunderstood that you can cut your, uh, your uh, relative's hair, you can cut, uh, you can do your, uh, your relative's hair, and that means you can go to their house and cut their hair, no. That is for people within your own home, within your own space, and we have to, you know, not try to bend the rules, but follow them. And it is difficult, it's hard, we all miss that personal touch. Um, and, and we'll be able to touch again if we want to. I'm kind of like, okay, let's do the bow. <laughs> um, but the point is that we do follow those regulations. Five people gathering in a space six feet apart. It's not five people gathered together, five and five and five and five, five people six feet apart. So those are things that we must follow in order to make sure that we are healthy and safe and we come out of this together. So Angie, I'll leave it up to you to close. And again, thank you so very much for participating. Thank you so much, Dr. Boone. And thank you to all of uh, our panelists uh, the comments that I'm receiving on Facebook is that this is wonderful information and they want us, we did record it, they definitely want us to share it on Facebook so that we can replay it and they can uh, listen to it in its entirety. Um, thank you, uh, Facebook, for tuning in. Um, and as Dr. Boone mentioned, this is, uh, this is not the first conversation that we've had and it will not be the last conversation that we have about COVID-19 because uh, the Durham community is committed to bringing information um, to help our people to save lives, essentially. Uh, we've heard from all of the panelists how serious this is. Uh, you all have been hopeful as well. We will get through it. However, um, very necessary steps that we have to take to get uh, to the other side. So thank you so much for empowering us. Um, uh, and we will get on the other, we will get to the other side. Thank you so much again. Uh, and Dr. Boone, that's all that I have. Okay, we'll be in touch. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>